Today on Adventures in Faith with Jerry Savelle. Don't stop dreaming. Just because the conditions may be not favorable or perfect. But what is new with faith people? The conditions are never perfect. Amen. Most of the time, they're not favorable. You just have to take your faith and change the circumstances. Open your Bibles, if you will, first of all tonight to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29, and a very familiar scripture, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Where there is no vision, the people perish. There are several translations that, that I have enjoyed reading over the years. One of them says, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. Another translation says, where there is no vision, uh, or uh, actually it says, where there is no prophetic oracle from God, then the people perish. Yeah. And I want to substitute the word vision tonight with the word dream. Where there is no dream, people perish. I've noticed over the years that when people stop dreaming, they start dying. When they don't have anything that motivates them. And during this time that we've been through since 2020, there's a lot of people that have stopped dreaming. They don't think that God can bring it to pass in these circumstances. But God, our God, is the God who specializes in what people say is impossible. He's El Shaddai. Amen. He's the God in whom nothing is impossible. And I want to encourage you tonight, don't stop dreaming. Just because the conditions may be not favorable or perfect. Well, what is new with faith people? The conditions are never perfect. Amen. Most of the time, they're not favorable. You just have to take your faith and change the circumstances. I've been doing that for 52 years now. Amen. And it's still working, praise God. So don't ever stop dreaming. Look at your neighbor and tell them, don't ever stop dreaming. I've been a dreamer all my life. As a little boy, I had dreams. My daddy used to tell my mother, say, that boy is, he, he's, He's dreaming all the time. And I did. I, I went to bed dreaming and I got up dreaming. And uh, when I was a young boy, of course, I shared some of this in one of the previous services. My dad, uh, who was my hero, he was my best friend all my life. He represented everything I wanted to be. And I had a wonderful relationship with my father. He was, he was my pal. He was my buddy. He was my friend. He was dead, but uh, he, he, was, he, was, he was just somebody I loved being with. I loved what he did. And uh, as I mentioned, my dad raced automobiles all my young life. I grew up on racetracks. Uh, my dad restored classic automobiles. My dad built hot rods. Um, you know, when you, when you grow up with a dad who is into speed, and I'm talking horsepower, you never own anything slow. I'm still redeemed from slow. I don't own anything that's slow. Hallelujah. My first bicycle, dad put a bigger sprocket on it so it'd pedal faster than anybody else on the street. My first go-kart, he bored the engine out and made it faster than any of the other go-karts. My first motor scooter, before I got into motorcycles, uh, dad took that old Cushman motor scooter and bored it out and put a different cam in it. And, and so it'd run faster than all the other boys on the street. And then my first 57 Chevrolet. It was the hottest one in my city. Oh, hallelujah. 
when Carol and I married, she had, she had a six-cylinder car. And she wanted me to go to church with her in that car. I said, I am not going to church with you in that car. Now, if I go to church, we'll go in my car. No, we're not going in your car. You'll race all the way there. I said, you better believe it. There's not an old woman in a Volkswagen going to beat me to the next light. And I'd race all the way to the church, make her some mad. And, uh, uh, and then finally I got me a 65 GTO. 389, four speed, three deuces, and it was, it was fast. I drove it to work on the week, weekdays and to the races on the weekend. And uh, I just, I, that's, that was my life. I loved being able to go fast. Well, my dad uh, was trained by General Motors to become, in 1953, a Corvette specialist. And not many body men knew how to work on Corvettes because they were built out of fiberglass. And so dad was trained by General Motors in 1953 when the first Corvette came out and he became a Corvette specialist. And uh, I was just a little boy when they came out. I was about six, seven years old. And uh, I came home from first grade, I believe it was, and, and there was a 1953 Polo white with red interior Corvette sitting in my dad's garage. And when I walked up and saw that car, I, I just could not get over how beautiful it was. And I thought, who owns this? And dad came home from work that day and I said, dad, who owns that car? He said, well, they sent it home with me. I said, why? He said, well, my job is to wreck it and rebuild it. He said, they want me to wreck it and rebuild it. And he said, uh, they want me to get to the place to where I can rebuild a Corvette in my sleep. And dad would take it out and just run it into a tree <laughs> and then take it home and rebuild it. And uh, so uh, I fell in love with Corvettes. And I told him, I said, as soon as I get big enough, this is what I'm going to drive. I'm going to drive them for the rest of my life. Now he worked for the Chevrolet dealership there in Shreveport and the owner was a man by the name of Howard Crumbly. And Mr. Crumbly knew how much I liked Corvettes. So every year when they got the new ones in, he would tell my dad, bring Jerry up and tell him there's a new one in the showroom and uh, let him come up here and sit in it. And so I'd come up there and uh, Mr. Crumbly would take me into the showroom and put me in the driver's seat. And he'd sit next to me in the, in the passenger seat. And he'd say, Jerry, can you see yourself owning one of these someday? I said, yes, sir. And I remember the one that I liked the most. It was 1957. It was a 57 uh, Corvette and uh, it was fuel injected and it was the biggest horsepower of that year. And uh, they, they, it was a milestone with a fuel injected 283. It produced 283 horsepower and that had never been done before. 283 cubic inches, 283 horsepower. And I'm sitting in that car and uh, Mr. Crumley said, can you see yourself owning one of these someday? Can you see yourself driving a car like this someday? I said, yes, sir, I will. Well, I wish you were still alive because I have that car today, praise God. <laughs> Amen. And uh, I was always dreaming, always dreaming. When I was uh, a young boy, there was a television program that came out and many of you will remember it, particularly if you're my age, uh, Route 66. Anybody remember Route 66? Buzz and Todd. Okay. And so, uh, by the way, Renee right here, her daddy and my daddy worked together at the Pontiac dealership. Yes, Isn't that right? Yes, and uh, uh, when, when the Route 66 came out, that was my favorite television program. Man, I did not miss Route 66. And I'd watch Buzz and Todd in that Corvette. I think it came out in about 1960, something like that. And uh, I'd watch them you know, do the Route 66 thing, you know, and I'd tell my dad, one day I'm going to do that. I'm going to do Route 66 in a Corvette. And uh, I have done it in my 1961 Corvette. I started in uh, Tulsa, went all the way to uh, Tucson, Arizona on Route 66. It was fun. 
I was living my dream, praise God. As a boy, I was always dreaming of cars I wanted to build. I'd have dreams of these cars. I'd see them in my dreams. And I, I had a cousin who was a commercial artist. He was about four years older than me. And I would describe to him what I saw in my dream and he would draw it. And if it wasn't quite like what I saw it, I'd say, no, the, the grill didn't look like that. Change that up a little bit. And he'd do what I told him. And then he'd change whatever needed to be changed. And in a little while, I said, that's exactly what I saw. Now, I could dream it, Wade could draw it, and my dad could build it. <laughs> we had a winning team, praise God. And we, my dad was building custom cars way back, you know, and, uh, and that's the reason he'd tell my mom, I'd say, Dad, I had a dream last night. And he'd say, was it another car? I said, yeah. I said, I can dream it, Wade can draw it, and you can build it. <laughs> you know, but then I got to the place where I said, Dad, I don't want you building it anymore. You teach me how to build it. And so by the time I was about 10 years old, in fact, I got a picture of me and my dad. Put that up there. This is me and my dad. And I'm about 10 years old there. And that man standing next to me, what he didn't know about automobiles they hadn't invented yet. He was a master. And uh, he started teaching me how to work on cars at that age. And uh, by the way, that 56 Chevrolet in the back, that was my first car. I drove it to high school. Dad bought it brand new. And as soon as I was able to get a driver's license, that was my first car. That's what Carolyn and I used to ride around in. Hallelujah. <laughs> Got to tell you a neat story about that. I, Carolyn and I didn't really start dating until I was in my second year of college. She was now a senior in high school. But when I was a senior in high school, I was dating another girl and I would, Carolyn lived down the road and I would go down in that 56 Chevrolet and pick up Carolyn and then we'd go to my girlfriend's house and I'd pick up my girlfriend, Carolyn get in the back seat, the girlfriend sat next to me in the front seat and then I'd drop my girlfriend off after school, Carolyn get back up in the front seat, then I'd drop her off at her house. I'm gonna write a book someday and just call it, I Married the Girl in the Back Seat. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and uh, so dad was always telling my mom, he said, that boy is a dreamer. Man, he, he is a dreamer. I was always dreaming. And usually it was centered around automobiles because that was my passion. I loved working on cars and uh, I loved making them faster. And I loved customizing them. I was always wanting to do something that nobody else did. In fact, uh, in, in during the time I owned an automotive business doing paint and body work and living my dream, I started buying wrecked Volkswagens and I would customize them. I'd soup up the engines, put mag wheels on them, paint them uh, uh, muscle car colors, put vinyl tops on them and I'd sell them like hotcakes. I mean, I couldn't build them fast enough. Nobody else was doing that in my town at that time. And I was always wanting to do something nobody else did, dreaming. And now I'm getting close to 75 years old and I have never stopped dreaming. I'm still dreaming. In fact, my dreams are bigger than they've ever been. I didn't stop dreaming when COVID hit. I said, I didn't stop dreaming. I'm still dreaming. I got big dreams. Some of them, are waiting to be fulfilled. Some of them have already been fulfilled. But I want to encourage you tonight, don't stop dreaming. Now, when I was growing up, as I mentioned uh, in one of the previous services, we had a, our first rock and roll station in Shreveport, Louisiana, was KWEL. And I think it started in about 55, somewhere along in there when the rock and roll era was kind of coming on the scene. In fact, in Louisiana, Shreveport, Louisiana, we had what they called the Louisiana Hayride. And uh, the Louisiana Hayride was where all the country Western singers came. And you had to make it at the Hayride before you got to the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville. 
And my dad used to take me to the uh, Louisiana Hayride nearly every weekend. I saw Elvis the first time he was there. I saw Johnny Cash. I saw uh, Patsy Cline. I saw all those who became famous and were on the uh, Grand Ole Opry and then later became very famous uh, country western singers. But I loved music. I couldn't sing. I wished I could sing. Man, I always wanted to sing. And I'd do my best, but I could remember all the songs, I could remember all the words, and I could remember who recorded them. In fact, uh, I should have been on Name That Tune. How many of you remember Name That Tune? I would have won. In fact, Brother Copeland and I have done that before on some of our vacation times. And uh, he'd start singing something. And he'd say, who recorded that? And I'd tell him. And then I'd, I'd sing something. And I'd say, who recorded that? And we'd go back and forth, you know. And we had one other guy join us one time. And we were just playing. We weren't, we weren't serious about it. And he said, I bet you my house you can't name this tune. And I named it. I wound up owning everything that man had before that trip was over with. Of course, I didn't take any of it, but we were just playing, you know. He said, I don't believe you. How could you remember all that? But I, I just, I loved music. And I, I would remember those songs and remember those words. Now, I would sing to Carolyn when we were dating. And I loved Paul Anka. How many of you remember Paul Anka? And one of the songs I used to sing to Carolyn, she would sit next to me over there, you know, I'd have my arm around her. And I would sing wherever we were going to the hamburger place or whatever, put your head on my shoulder. Oh, yeah. And then after Carolyn and I married, July the 15th, 1966, and I have a picture of that too. You won't believe how young I looked. I look like I'm 14 years old. And I don't know where that left ear came from. Look at the size of that thing. <laughs> don't I look like I'm about 14? And we got married July the 15th, 1966. And for 52 years in particular, since we've learned the Word of God, we have been dreaming impossible dreams. And we don't intend to quit, praise God. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, you still should be dreaming impossible dreams. <laughs> Fighting the odds. That's what the life of faith is all about. Yeah. Fighting against the odds. Yes, you know, most of the time, uh, God tells you to do something, and usually it's impossible when he tells you to do it. Yes. Gloria said one time, if it was possible, then it wouldn't require faith. Amen. And the Bible says the just shall live by faith. So my instructions from the Lord tonight is to endeavor to stir you up about not failing to dream. Don't stop dreaming. Don't stop dreaming impossible dreams. Now go with me to Ephesians chapter three, because the God we serve is quite capable of bringing them all to pass. No matter what the, what the conditions are, no matter what's happening around us, God specializes in doing the impossible. Ephesians 3.20, now unto him that is able, everybody say, my God is able. My God is able. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power of that worketh in us. Now, the Amplified Bible, I really especially like this version of this verse. Now to him who by action of his power that is at work within us is able to carry out his purpose and do superabundantly far over and above all that we dare ask or think infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, and dreams. Notice what I, what, I, what I wrote in my notes. If I can dream it, God can do it. Yeah. Amen. If God gives you a dream, then he is certainly capable of fulfilling it. Amen. 
Why would anybody want to stop dreaming? I remember uh, my dad, when he got older, and he'd, he'd, uh, he'd suffered several heart attacks, a massive heart attack when he was a young man in his late 50s, early 50s, actually. I was in Kenya, and uh, uh, I was getting ready to preach this one particular morning. It was still evening here in the U.S., different time zones. And the Lord said to me, pray for your dad. He's just had a massive heart attack. And so I began praying for my dad. And of course, I wanted to get up and fly back home right then. But back in those days, there was only two flights out of Nairobi coming back to uh, the UK. And, and they, were, they were not on the days that God had said this to me. I still had to wait another three days before I could even get out of the country. And so I got back to London and I flew from London back home. And when I walked through the door, my wife said, your dad's in Florida visiting his brother and had a massive heart attack and he's not expected to live. So I got in my plane and flew down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida and uh, I walked in the hospital, met the doctor. And the doctor said, uh, sir, your, your dad's not going to leave this hospital. He, he will not make it through the night. I said, well, take me to him. And of course, they had him all hooked up with everything you can imagine. And, and when he saw me walk through the room, tears come down his cheeks. And I said, Dad, they're telling me that you're not going to leave this hospital, that you're not going to make it through the night. And I said, but I don't believe it's time for you to go. And I don't want you to go. I said, but it's your decision. I'll pray however you want me to pray. If you want to go, I don't want you to go, but if that's what you want to do, then I'll pray that way. But if you want to stay, then we're going, we're going to pray and trust God to heal you. And he said, I don't want to go. I said, that's all I need to hear. And so I laid my hands on him and prayed with him. And uh, uh, I brought him home the next day. Okay. Now, he, he, he lived and he got better and got stronger and his heart improved. But after he got into his uh, late 60s, almost 70, he began to get weary and uh, he pretty much had lost the will to win. And I would come home from meetings and I'd go straight to my mom and dad's house to see him. And I went in one day and I said, uh, mom, where's dad? She said, he's in his bedroom and he, he, hadn't, he hadn't had a good day. I said, what's the matter? She said, well, he's been crying all, all morning. And so I went in there and I said, dad, what's the matter? He said, son, I'm tired. I'm weary. I just don't know if I can, I can take this anymore. I said, dad, I haven't been home yet. I'm going home, to see Carolyn, but I want you up in the morning at nine o'clock dressed and I'm coming to get you. He said, where are we going, son? I said, I'm not telling you, just be dressed. Nine o'clock, I will pick you up. Okay. So I went home and I called out at Texas Motor Speedway and I hired a professional race driver and I said, we'll be there about 9.30 in the morning and I want you to drive my dad around Texas Motor Speedway about 20 laps. I didn't tell my dad. I just went over the next morning, picked him up, got him in the car. He said, where are we going, son? I said, you'll know when we get there. <laughs> so I got over to Texas Motor Speedway, got out in the pit area, and uh, the guy was waiting for us, got my dad in that car, strapped him in there, and the guy took off, went about 20 laps, and man, you talk about getting the adrenaline pumping. <laughs> and dad lived another 15 years, you know, so... <laughs> Amen. All it took was just get some adrenaline pumping, you know, get the will to win again. Amen. So sometimes when people get bad news, you know, they lose the will to continue. They, they don't think that God's going to make it happen anymore. Don't allow that to happen to you. Because if God gave you that dream, he fully intends 
to bring it to pass. Can you say amen? How many of you have a dream tonight? Now, I would ask you, how many of you have let go of your dream? But I don't want to ask you that because I don't want to see the number of hands. But you'd be surprised at the number of Christians just in the last 18 months or so have let go of their dreams. I know, I know pastors that were talking to me in 2019 about building a new building, building a new church, expanding, doing this. And now because of what happened in 2020, they've put the plans away. Yeah, but Brother Jerry, I mean, you know, we haven't been able to have church. Well, since when does that limit God? Are you ready to see God do something new? What if God is about to move in your life like never before? Today's special offer, the Barrier Breaking First Special Package, contains Jerry Savelle's brand new two-part CD series, Barrier Breaking First, his insightful book, Knowing God, and his best-selling book, If Satan Can't Steal Your Dreams, He Can't Control Your Destiny. In this special package, Jerry reveals a prophetic word given to him about the days to come, how God desires you to experience new first in your life, and how to come into agreement with God and His plan to see them manifest. It's time for you to go further than ever before. It's time for a new breakthrough. Don't delay. Call or go online now to jerrysavelle.org and request your copy of the Barrier Breaking First special package. Don't miss what God is about to do. Order now and begin to position yourself for new breakthroughs, new favor, and new blessings. Thank you once again for joining us today. I trust these programs have been a blessing to your life. And I pray that in the name of Jesus, what you've learned, you'll be a doer of it. And God promises when you're a doer of his word, then you will be blessed in all your deeds. Amen. Before we leave the air, let me remind you of our special product offer. First of all, two CDs entitled Barrier Breaking First. You know, one of the things I've learned about first is every time you have one, it's like a domino effect. It's just one comes right after the other. And then this special little book I wrote a number of years ago, If Satan Can't Steal Your Dreams, He Can't Control Your Destiny. God gave you that dream. It's worth fighting for. And praise God, if you will stay in faith, then God will see to it that that dream becomes reality. Don't let Satan steal your dream. And then once again, this little book, Knowing God. I wrote this book a number of years ago, and it's still a very powerful lesson. One of the greatest teachings I believe I've ever done, knowing God. So this is our resource package for this week. And uh, I want to encourage you to place your order. You can go to jerrysavelle.org, or you can look on the screen and find out all the ordering information and the price. But we encourage you to place your order right now while it's fresh on your mind. And let me encourage you to join us again next week for Adventures in Faith. We look forward to seeing you then. And remember, your faith will overcome the world.